Hi everyone, I'm Katie for those of you who have not met me yet and right now I'm in the middle of doing a raw vegan challenge for the month of February. It's going great. We're having struggles and challenges along the way as you would with any new change in your life and as we approach each one we're trying to show you and share with you what's happening in our day-to-day -day lives and how we're progressing so that a lot of your questions are answered. I hope that you're enjoying the series and I think this is day 22, day 23, I'm not sure, I'll have to check. I am going to be doing a pretty heavy topic today and one that I cannot find many places out there. And if you hear any background noises, that's my family, they do live here too. What does the Bible have to say about being vegan? Is it biblical? Is it scriptural? And this is a topic that I have studied in a roundabout way all my life because I am very passionate about animals. I was over 15 years in the veterinary world. Animals were a huge, huge part of my life, always, always have been, always will be. I love them dearly and they will always have that place. It, they define me and who I am and my personality. So a lot of the questions that I hear out there were the same ones posed to me by my parents who were kind of trying to get my goat with some of these questions and get me to think because they were coming from a different mindset. Both my parents are avid hunters. They love to hunt. They definitely eat meat. Growing up in that house, it was a bit of a struggle for me because I seemed like the oddball one. I was the one always bringing home bugs and lizards and stuff, anything I could hold on to these, these precious little lives and just look at them and be in, be in awe of them. Let's get to the topic at hand. And I'm sorry, this is not going to be a truth or untruth type thing. It's going to be more of, let's think about this and really see what is being said here. Because there are many areas in the Bible where exact clarification is not given. And we don't know why. Maybe we're not ready for that. Maybe God wants us to discover it for ourselves and each person is going to have a special word from God on how they should be a good steward of their lives here on earth based on principles and from there on. Because some things are absolutely definite, fundamental truths. If you are a follower of Christ and you believe that the Bible is 100% from God, then you know that. So let's look at the things that are in the Bible what God has said and what God has inspired men to say in the Bible and see what we can pull from this. And the first question that I get from, or the first objection that I get from a lot of people when I'm really expressing my love and concern for an animal or animals in general is they say, well, animals don't have a soul. You will hear that from a lot of Christians who say that and absolutely believe it. The verse that they are basing this on is Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And I apologize for those of you that don't appreciate the King James Version. This version is just beautiful to me. It's like Shakespeare. So this is the version I like. Feel free to look at your own version. Um, feel free to pick up a concordance, whatever you would like to, to study the scriptures for yourself. This is just my personal preference. So there you heard in the verse, God created man in his own image. Now that's what God says about it. He does not say that us being created in his image means that we have souls like God and that's the definition of it. It also doesn't say that we are created in his image and that only means that we look in our appearance exactly like God. It does not say that either. What is in God's image? We can speculate about our souls and our appearance. What is it exactly? Do we really know? And no, we don't. And until we can understand the mind of God, until we can understand what he looks like and who he is inside, how are we ever going to understand how we are in his image? All we know is we have been bestowed with a very special honor that no other being on this planet has been given. And we don't know exactly all 
the intricacies of what that honor is. Does that mean that animals do not have a soul? No, it does not. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that animals do not have a soul. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that animals do have a soul. So that is something to think about. Please be gentle with your words and do not tell people that God says one thing or God says another thing unless you know for sure that this is a fundamental truth in the Bible because we don't want to be breaking apart relationships and being unkind with our words to people through what we think and our own personal interpretation. We need to be very clear about what the Bible does say and what it doesn't. And where there is openness, let's have open, compassionate hearts and study the word together and see what God reveals to us. Because if we seek him, he promises he will not hide from us. We seek truth. He is there ready to give it to us. So that's the first verse that I wanted to bring to your mind. One verse that struck me, it's it's what is not said. It's so interesting when you read between the lines and you ask questions. What was it said here? So let me share with you another verse from Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, and this is talking about Satan, but he is in the form of a serpent. So what could that be? Um, back Way back in time, dragons were also called serpents. Snakes are called serpents. So we know it's a reptilian beast of some sort. So it says in Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now think about this here. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. What would you have expected today? In this day and age, if a serpent came up and spoke to a woman, would she have conversed with him so casually like that? No, she would be like, oh my goodness, how do you speak? None of the others can speak. How come you have words? She would have been intrigued by that. But no, it wasn't a novelty at all. She wasn't surprised. She just had conversation with him as if it was the most normal thing in the world. So it does not say in the Bible that animals could talk. Sorry, it doesn't. It says this. You can read between the lines and make your own deduction. I see here that this was a normal occurrence. And we do not hear any more about this issue pretty much until Balaam's donkey. And that's a lesser known story, so let me share that with you. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with the story of Balaam, he was pretty much um, a magician, a wizard type person in his day. And the Israelites were traveling through one kingdom, saw them, the king was afraid of them because he knew that they had been conquering anybody who stood in their path and was not um, kind to them and hospitable to them. And he wanted Balaam to curse God's people. And over and over again, God thwarts him and instead has Balaam bless his people. So it's a very frustrating story for Balaam and for the king. And there is a little snippet of it here where Balaam is traveling on his donkey and God does not want him going where he is going. You'll find the story in Numbers 22 and verse 22 is where I'm picking up. And God's anger was kindled because he went. This is talking about Balaam. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass. I'm sorry, donkey. And his two servants were with him. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, apparently he was the only one that was able to see God standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. The ass turned out of the way and went to the field. Very smart donkey there. <laughs> I would too. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall being on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. 
And when he saw, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto his ass, Because thou hast mocked me, and I would there be a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head, and he fell fat on, flat on his face. You can go on to read the rest of the story. It's a pretty, pretty cool story. Now, yes, Balaam answered the donkey and didn't seem in the story to be surprised about that. So you may point that out from Genesis. However, he was also, like the Bible said, pretty infuriated, very, very angry. Makes me wonder, did it occur to him that something really crazy was happening here or was he just so mad that the words came out in answer. I don't know. Or what I do find interesting is the terminology. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. It doesn't say that he created speech for the donkey or that he spoke through the donkey. He said he opened the mouth of the donkey. So what does that mean? We can only speculate, but I tend to think that that's something that is opened was what obviously recently shut. Everybody's familiar with the story of Noah and the ark. If you're reading in the Bible, you will know that right after Noah got out of the ark with his family and all the animals, things were very different. We've never had rainbows before. A lot of things are changing, and one of the major things that changes is Genesis 9-3 where God is talking to Noah and he says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I have given you all things. So that then is God's permission for us to eat meat. And I would like to state that this is permission. And before then, it looks like the permission had not been given to do so. Did people eat meat before that time? We don't know. But since then, we have as humans. Why? Why did God give this permission? Again, we can only speculate. Is it because it was good for us and essential nutrition that we must have? Well, science is showing us that that is not the case. Our bodies are not made to consume animal products. People have love to eat animal products throughout the Bible, and they've also taken very good care of their animals. They're very godly people. You see the shepherds, very, very loving and gentle, and will risk their own lives to save a lost lamb. So where did us tenderly taking care of sheep, as God says he takes care of us, turn into the slaughterhouses of today? I don't know, but that seems to be a far cry from what God would have for us. We are here as stewards. We all, that's what our role has been in tending this planet and taking care of it is a stewardship role. And when you are a steward, that means that there is somebody over you and you are accountable. Now and forever, you are accountable for the choices that you make here. How do you treat others? And that doesn't just include people, it includes the animals, it includes the plants, it includes the planet as a whole. We are not an island unto ourselves and everything we do has a chain reaction. So as Christians, when we go to a store and we purchase something and we give them the money that we worked hard to earn and that God has given to us, and we purchase that something, does what we just purchased honor God? And that is one of the biggest questions here. Are we honoring God with that choice? Is it a pretty package of meat? Do you know where that meat came from? Do you know how the animal was treated its entire life? Do you know how it was killed? Would you do that to an animal with your own hands? If you do not know 
If you pick up a jug of milk and you do not know what happened in order to make that milk possible, or a crate of eggs, any of that, if you don't know the story behind it, and you wouldn't do that with your own hands, if you do not believe that that is honoring to God, then I point you to the book of Daniel. Right at the beginning of Daniel 1, you see a pretty scary time for the Israelites. They had been besieged, they were taken into captivity, many of them were killed. So you find these fine young men who love the Lord. Um, we know them as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now. They were to be some of the king's prized men. Conflict comes in really soon of whether they're going to honor God or not. The king offers them great luxury, the best of everything, the best of the best of teachers, the best of clothes, the best of place to live, the best of food. And along with the best of food came food from the king's own table, wine that he drank, meat that he ate. To them, it had been defiled because of that. And they requested, in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Pretty scary to do, but he wanted to honor his God. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So basically he's saying, if you don't eat this and you end up looking sickly, I'm the one on the chop. So down in verse 12, let's pick up what happens here, what Daniel says back to him. He says, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So basically fruits and vegetables, that's it. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Then. Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Again, we have to um, make some speculations. Is this supernatural power that God gave them for them to be healthier just on fruits and vegetables? It very well could have been. But as we can see, proven by science today and by some of the most elite athletes out there that have been vegan for many, many years and who try to reach the same goals that they set now on meat were not able to switch over to a vegan diet and now have far surpassed everything that they were able to accomplish prior. It would seem to be that maybe 10 days is a little too short here or maybe it's just enough time to show the health coming back into the body. There are many other verses that you can speculate on health. For example, the children of Israel going through the wilderness, God's feeding them manna this entire time, obviously a perfect food that they could sustain on forever. And they get really sick of manna, start complaining, and God sends them a huge flock of quail that they eat until they're sick and vomiting the next day. And it's not a pretty picture of gluttony. And I grew up thinking this was gluttonous. But it also could have been that their intestines were very unhappy with the sudden surge of meat again that did not digest properly and was not obviously a perfect food. I would say that in the book of Daniel, that's the best claim for veganism besides Genesis and in the Garden of Eden where everything was perfect. Adam and Eve doesn't talk to us about them cooking their food. It would be kind of funny if they did. So they were probably just eating the raw foods, nibbling on it all day like you see most of the creatures who are herbivores, they eat most of the day. And they were su surrounded with abundance so they never had to go looking for anything. Could it be that the plants that were around that supplied us 
with the perfect food are not in enough abundance now. He knew that and gave us meat to fill in the gaps. Again, it's only speculation. All we can see is what he said in the Bible and what we know today proven through science about nutrition. And nutrition is over and over pointing to we are not made to consume animal products. It is nothing but detrimental to our health. It's definitely advisable if that's the only food you have around that you eat to live. There are so many other verses in the Bible and passages that we can study related to animals and what our interaction to them should be and what God expects from us and try to extrapolate what we should do individually and what our choices should be. But I'm going to leave that for you to study. Like I said, I'm sorry, this isn't going to be a yes, you should eat meat and no, you should not. Since the Bible says that you can, it's not a thou shalt or thou shalt not. You need to learn your best what the Bible says and what God expects of you individually to be a steward and to have the knowledge. We are all supposed to have knowledge. We are supposed to be able to give an answer for why we do the things we do. And it can't be because I'm choosing to do this because I didn't want to take the time to learn about it. Or I'm choosing to do this because I don't want to know about that. That's, that's not going to hold any water. I'm, I'm sorry we are accountable. No guilt knowing that you are doing what he has asked you to do. And he is blessing what you do. And that, that's really important in all walks of life. We have God's blessing on what we just did. And that leads me to the last verse I wanted to share with you. If you take a look at 1 Corinthians 8.19, here is a big one for me. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye, ye are not your own? So this is talking about believers, about Christians specifically, not just all mankind. So those that have trusted Christ as their Savior, who have asked them to be their Lord and to save them from their sins and take them to heaven one day, those people have God's Holy Spirit in them. And that means we are now not on our own, just me, myself, and I. We are accountable to God. He indwells us. That's awesome. Now think about the word temple. And if you look at the temples from the Old Testament, they just got more and more elaborate as the people were able to supply more wealth to take care of it. But they were always very specific and regimented. This room is for this. This room is for this. This is, your, this is the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest enters at a certain time. It was a very, very sacred place that had different levels of holiness where you got closer and closer to the presence of God. So when we have the presence of God inside of us, we now have the Holy of Holies inside of us. How are we treating our temple? This is something to think about in all areas of life, including how do we groom ourselves? How do we dress ourselves? Are we dressing ourselves like a holy temple? Are we throwing on any dirty old rag? Are we trying to cover ourselves, our figure up with something that looks lumpy and frumpy just because we haven't taken the time to ask them to help us to dress better? Our appearance is important. If we're gonna say we're a child of God, our appearance is important. What we do is important. How we speak is important. It's all very, very important. This is a holy temple. And it's about time we started treating it like such. I'm going to pick on Baptists a little here because I was raised in a Baptist background, so I'm most familiar with it. And I'm going to say, especially in the Bible Belt, this is a key thing that I see quite frequently. Baptists love to have their social events, and social events most always revolve around food. And you can apply this to every area of life. People love social events that revolve around food. So, a favorite thing is the potluck, where everyone brings their favorite dish to share. These foods that we're bringing to the potlucks to share with other believers who are also God's holy temples, are we truly giving them the best? Or could we do better? Because I see tables, especially in the South, covered in pork 
and mashed potatoes and jello desserts and canned vegetables and heavy, heavy desserts topped with Cool Whip. I'm, I'm really focusing on this out here. Is that the best that we can do? When we see so many people with disease and you're going to hear about it in the church. I'm telling you, the prayer requests are going up and I would say by 90% of the time it's about health. Health concerns from the little tiniest ones to the elderly and all these health problems that are caused in majority by poor diet. Isn't it about time we start setting a better example in every area and not let our taste buds be selfish and be resistant to change? We know that fruits and vegetables are better for us than the other choices that we're making. So why are we choosing to select other items to eat as the majority of our? We already know the perfection of the Garden of Eden where there was no animal products being eaten at the time. Can we go back? Can we claim our Eden here on this earth? No, of course we can't. But it's definitely something to reach for if we know that that was God's original design for us. And that is very clear. That was his original design. Why aren't we reaching for it? Why are we going as far away from it as possible just because we're comfortable? Or that's what my friend is doing, or that's how my mom raised me. What does that have to do with God? What does that have to do with being his child, with being his temple? So I'm, I'm definitely not trying to offend anybody and I want to be as kind as I can in my words. I just want you to think for yourself. If you'd like to know more about how diet plays a role and how animal products actually affect the human body and why we are not designed to eat meat, milk, dairy, and eggs, I'd love it if you would check out the links below. I'm not going to do a video on that because other people have done just such a superb job showing their sources with little to no bias and so give them credit for that. Thank you for watching. I know this video was long and it was a pretty heavy topic. I just felt that it was not sufficiently given the attention that it deserves. It's been looked over a lot and it's a lot of it's about time that we were more thoughtful with how we treat ourselves and how we are good stewards of what God has given to us as Christians. So, as I said, it's not going to be black and white. You're going to have to go to prayer and determine this, search the scriptures for yourself, and ask God what he would have you do as an individual. Love to all of you. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you again tomorrow.